Thank you very much. Uh, when I got the invitation to come speak, uh, I said uh, the one thing, just don't put me just before drinking, please. <laughs> so th thank you very much for that. The last time I was here was uh, COVID January. And uh, what an odd thing to go through because it feels like absolutely yesterday and forever ago at the same time. So I'm glad you all made it. Uh, I'm even gladder, to be honest, that I made it. <laughs> and he here we are. So uh, the... the uh, the quote Matthias had about my personal mission it wasn't quite right, so I figured I'll start by correcting him because I just I just love giving him needles. It's a lot of fun. If you haven't done it, definitely give it a try. Um, <clears throat> the The mission statement I came up with was: This was like 20 years into my career. I'm like I've done patterns and J unit and test driven development and like what in the world draws these things together? Because some stuff was very abstract and some stuff was very concrete and technical. And this phrase popped into my head to help geeks feel safe in the world. And uh, I thought, yeah, that about sums it up. Because uh, sometimes as geeks, well, we, we have tremendous amounts of leverage and sometimes we're not quite aware of it or we're not we don't know how to take that responsibility. So the technical parts about testing so that you take responsibility for the quality of your work, that's a way of feeling safe in the world. It, you kind of know if you're messing around and people are yelling at you and they're upset about it, it feels kind of unsafe. Well, doing, writing fewer bugs is a way to feel safer. But so is having structure around you have how you have conversations with um, uh, uh, your peers, your manager, other folks with a different perspective than yours. All of that goes into helping you f feel safe in the world. So um, in uh, 2005, I was invited by Stephen Fraser to, uh, to sit on a panel with uh, Ed Jordan of Blessed Memory and Larry Constantine um, to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the publication of the book Structured Design. How many of you have seen the book Structured Design? Okay, this is, uh, this is easy. Um, so I had it, I'd used it as a college textbook. So I thought, in preparation for this panel, I had better read it for the first time. <laughs> so I started reading this 25-year-old textbook with its, with its examples about paper tape machines and these newfangled higher-level languages versus assembly language. And, and yet, it became a page-turner for me. Uh, I'd been doing software development for 20-some years professionally by then, and I felt pretty good about my ability to design software. But here were Newton's laws of motion for software design. Uh, articulated clearly and precisely with careful thought behind them. And I thought, why don't we have this level of understanding of software design in our, in our craft. Like, how, how did this get lost? And so I vowed then that I was going to update that material. I was going to present that to the world of software developers because this, this is really what we need. So that's in 2005. Um, I made a couple of attempts. Uh, I had a, a thing I called responsive design, which got taken over by the mobile phone people. Um, and I could explain coupling pretty early in that process, but I couldn't explain cohesion in a way that didn't leave people going. So 
I, uh, I just kind of let that rest for a while. And that's the way I just have a bunch of problems sitting in the back of my head. And every once in a while, one will raise its hand and then I'll take it out and work on it for a little while. And usually don't make any progress. So I put it back in the back. <clears throat> so I started writing essays. This is about five years ago. I started writing essays around software design. I thought, okay. And I had a two-week period, unexpected two-week period before I started a job. And I thought, well, let me just see how much of this book that I want to write I can get written in two weeks. So I sat down, and it was very productive. And uh, I, I, made, I made progress, uh, but also the first line was a, was a doozy for me. The first thing, I sat down, I put my fingers on the keyboard, and I wrote, Software design is an exercise in human relationships. What? Software design is an exercise in human relationships. No, 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 no. I want to talk about coupling and cohesion, and I want to talk about power law distributions, and I want to talk about uh, uh, net present value versus optionality. I, th that's what software design is about, all these technical factors. Uh, well, if I wrote it, it must mean something. And the more I thought about what I'd just written, the more I realized that is the crux of the issue, that the things that hold us back as technical people are, are never technical factors. We wouldn't be in the position that we're in unless we could learn new techniques, unless we could understand technical concepts. What holds back all of the geeks that, I, um, like me personally, and the geeks that I've coached over my career, it, it's always human stuff. So here's how book writing goes. You think, okay, here's a topic, and there's no way I could write a whole book about this topic. And you start writing, and it gets longer and longer, and you realize, oh, there's, there's no way this is fitting into one book. So let me just take a quarter of this, and that will be the book. But there's no way I could write a whole book about just that. And then you start writing on it, and it expands and expands, and you think, no way this is fitting into one book and you slice it even finer until you have something that couldn't possibly have a book's worth of material and then that's about a book's worth of material that's that's how I do it anyway I, I don't know any other way because every book I've written has been like this so I'll point at the end towards the larger direction that I'm going about relationships but I want to start with the most fundamental relationship in software development, and it's one that if you don't get right, none of the rest of it's going to be right, and that's the relationship with you yourself. And what I see over and over again is uh, programmers, there's, it's, they make a big mess, they think, oh, oh, uh, you know, I'm a bad programmer, or I wouldn't have made this mess in the first place, and it's really hard to change, and the feedback's slow, and the tests are really slow to run, but that's, it's just a sign of my commitment to my craft that I power through in spite of all that. That's not a healthy relationship with yourself. <laughs> if I touched a, uh, touched a nerve there, good, that's not a healthy relationship with yourself. Our job is not supposed to be painful. So sometimes it is, but it's not supposed to be. And if it is on a regular basis, we have a different issue to, to talk about. So <clears throat> that's, that was the slice, slice, slice. This is the topic of this book, Tidy First, question mark that I'll be taking material from today. And um, the, the, the book is centered around this question that comes up 10 times a day. As a programmer, I need to change this code. It's ugly. The 
structure of the code makes it harder to change, do I tidy first? And there's two dogmatic wrong answers. One is always. And uh, this is one of the things that motivated me to write a software design book is there's a couple of software design books out there which just say, well, if the code's messy, you clean it up. That's you just, you know, somebody's waiting for some feature. Well, that's just too bad. <laughs> you are the high priest or priestess of this code. And uh, if they want to commune with the deities of computing, they're just going to have to go through you. Uh, well, that's not, a, that's not a healthy relationship. But then there's the other one, which is this self-immolative, never, I'm never going to tidy this code up. I deserve to edif modify code like this. This is, I'm payment for my sins. <laughs> I must deserve this or it wouldn't be like this. Even if I didn't make these mistakes, someone else, my, one of my brothers and sisters, did make these mistakes, and I have to pay for their pain as well. And that's also not a healthy relationship with your code or with yourself. And uh, this is the international symbol for trade-off. Did you know that? Yeah. Uh, so... The answer, of course, should I tidy first, is it depends. And the cool thing is when I started describing, even at this micro scale of software design, when I started listing all the factors that go into whether to tidy first, I got to pull in all of that technical stuff, all of those concepts that I wanted, a little bit of them, not the really cool, juicy bits, but a little bit of them. I could pull them in and use that as an explanation for, okay, you're faced with this question, ugly code, tidy first, yes or no? Oh, well, now I have to think about coupling and cohesion and power laws and net present value versus optionality and so on and so forth. So I get to talk about a little bit of all of software design in a context that everybody uh, encounters on a daily basis as a developer. And that will be the foundation of what I expect to be a series of books, which I'll outline when, when we get to the end. Now, the way I do these presentations is I pray that I've, here we go, are we up? We're up. I don't know what those lines are, but they look interesting. Um, so, uh, how many of you were in Vlad's coupling presentation? Okay, so uh, if, there's a, if I go too fast, please ask a question. Uh, if you have a question, I guarantee that 20 other people in here also have the question and don't have the uh, whatever to just up and ask it. So you'll be doing other people a favor. If I go too quickly through this, please let me know. Uh, I, have, I have some uh, things to add to what Vlad said. Let me put it that way. Um, so the first thing that I have to, to, to add is um, there's a specific reason for doing software design, uh, which is the one that we're getting paid for. Now, everything doesn't reduce to uh, euros, but if we forget that things also reduce to euros, we're gonna have a bad time. So, uh, Vlad was talking about pain. We have some pain, and software design lets us address this pain. And, I, I don't, uh, that's not how I see it. I think it's much more specific than that. And this is straight out of structured design. I call what follows uh, Constantine's equivalence. So Larry Constantine was one of the two people who wrote the book Structured Design. And the way they wrote it was by examining a bunch of programs at IBM and 
looking at the ones that tended to be cheap to change versus the ones that were expensive to change. And they said, what is common between all of these very different programs that are cheap to change? What is common to all these different programs that are expensive to change? And so uh, Larry's observation is that the cost of software, yeah, that works. The cost of software, the f first observation is that the cost of software is approximately equal to the cost of change. That is, maybe we, th we think about, oh, I'm going to develop this software and that's what's expensive and so we should make that cost less. But that initial period before you go into production is irrelevant in the time scale of the program. Either nobody's going to use it and it kind of doesn't matter, or people are going to use it and will spend 10, 100, 1,000 times as many euros changing the software as we ever did in that initial phase. So, so any technique that focuses on that initial phase is just looking at the wrong thing to optimize because it's such a small fraction of the total cost of the software. So the second observation in Constantine's equivalent is that the cost of change, not all changes are, are the same size. Some changes that you make are, are very expensive and some changes are cheap. And if you add up the cost of the few really expensive changes and you compare that to the sum of the cost of all the cheap changes, those few really expensive changes dominate the equation. So we can, for purposes of optimizing costs, we can ignore the cost of those little changes. People come to you, they say, can I have a widget that does this? You make a widget that does that. They say, can I have a widget that does this? You make a widget that does that. In the overall picture, those don't matter compared to when they say, can I have a widget that does this? And you say, oh. Currently, the model has one email per customer, and that's actually spread all over the place, that assumption, and we're going to have to go away for nine months and get ready to make that change, and then the change is going to be easy. That, those expensive changes, those things that break fundamental assumptions in the system, those are the ones that dominate the cost of software. And then the third part of Constantine's equivalent is that the, why are those big changes expensive? It's because I change this, which means I have to change this and this, which means I have to change these four things, which means, which means, so the cost of the big changes is approximately equal to this, this virality, this, I change this, which means I have to change those things too. And the word that they use to describe that transmission of change from one element to another element was coupling. Now, coupling as a word, th there was a very precise definition. In structured design, if you read it, I don't remember what page it's on because I have better things to do, but it's there, black and white, that's the definition of coupling. It says, if I change this, I have to change that, those two things are coupled. And it's that tr transmission of, of change that makes those expensive changes expensive. So I can put all of these together and say that the cost of software you see where this is going is approximately equal to the coupling.
And that's what's being addressed with software design. The reason we design software is so that we can change it and that we can change it at reasonable cost. If we never had to change the functionality of the software, the computer doesn't care if the uh, variables are named in some rational way or X, Y, and Z. Makes no difference to the computer. If we don't have to change it, nobody ever touches that code, nobody cares about the structure of it. Is it one gigantic function or is it a million tiny little objects? The structure just doesn't matter until the moment that you want to change how it behaves. Now, turns out that coupling happens all the time for all kinds of reasons, and when you dig into it, there's, there's a, a, a whole um, taxonomy of forms of coupling and their cost and so on. But um, one thing about it is, as software designers, one of the things we can do is reduce coupling. But that also, whoops, I want, didn't mean to go backwards. There we go. As designers, when we spend time, energy, money on reducing coupling, that costs too. And now we're back into one of these. We have a trade-off space where we could try to decouple the, there, here we have the cost of coupling, and if we've driven way too far up here where everything we touch breaks something in some random distant place, that's very expensive. But also decoupling costs, and if we try to decouple all the things, in fact, you can't decouple everything, and if you did decouple things, and I'll explain how, how this goes in a, in a second. If you decouple for the kind of changes that you have today and you start making different kind of changes tomorrow, you're going to discover all new forms of coupling that you didn't suspect were there. So we can spend way too much on decoupling. We can w spend way too much on coupling. And what we're trying to do is find that balance in the middle where we're spending a reasonable amount on both of those factors. So this is about cost management in software development. Software design is a way to control the costs of continued development of software. That's, that's what we're here for. Questions so far? Somebody warned me that there are people lurking up there and it was a little bit disconcerting. I hadn't realized it would be this disconcerting. Nothing? Okay, so let's get us a new page. How do we do a new page? Uh, I'm just gonna erase everything, how about that? You can't stop me, computer, ha, okay. So, so coupling, what is, what is coupling, uh, has come to mean two things depend on each other. They, they are connected in some way. That's not the original definition of coupling. And it's fine to talk about which elements in software are dependent on each other in some kind of way. But there's this very specific relationship between elements that is what coupling originally meant, and that's, what, that's the definition that I'm going to use. So we have these elements in, in software, so you, you have a bunch of functions, or you have a bunch of services, or you have a bunch of repos, or whatever, they're elements, and they're related to each other, and uh, two elements, E1 and E2, are coupled, E1, E2, with respect to a specific change, delta, this doesn't look like a delta, that's defined as, if I change E1, that means I have to change E2 also. This is already a little different than 
most of the definitions I had seen of coupling. But going back to the original, this is, this is the one that's in structured design. So you can have two elements and they can be coupled with respect to certain changes and decoupled with respect to others. So if I have a function that calls another function, they are coupled with respect to the name of the called function. If I want to change the name of the called function, I have to go change the caller at the same time. So those two things are coupled with respect to name changes. But they aren't coupled with respect to formatting changes. If I, if I change from spaces to tabs or tabs to spaces, whichever one pisses you off, uh, in the called function, the calling function can blithely ignore that. So they're not coupled with respect to those specific changes. This is why a static analysis of coupling makes no sense. I can't take the code, crank it through something, and it tells me I'm way coupled or I'm not way coupled, because I have to know what changes I'm making. So if I, uh, if I have a tax calculation, and I get new tax regulations once a year, and I have to go change the tax calculator, uh, th that, that element, the tax calculator, is coupled with respect to changes coming in from the outside. But uh, there's a lot of other changes in the system that it won't be coupled to. Now, coupling can be uh, subtle, and uh, uh, can be very expensive. So one of my favorite examples of coupling, this comes from Facebook, is there were, there were two services that happened to sit in the same physical rack. So you've got a rack, a bunch of servers in them, and you've got a network switch sitting on the top of the rack. And one of the services changed its backup procedure from doing little incremental backups once a day to doing once a week big backups. Well, the little incremental backups weren't any problem. The network switch had plenty of bandwidth. But when they started doing these big backups once a week, the other service would fail. And it would fail because those two services were coupled with respect to changes to the backup procedure because the network switch had a limited amount of bandwidth, those teams didn't even know each other existed. The system was coupled with respect to that particular change in ways that nobody anticipated. And if you go and look at, I don't know, if you, one time I was sitting at Powell's Bookstore in Portland, and if you haven't been to Portland, and you do go, go to Powell's Books, because it's awesome. Uh, and, I, because, and the reason it's awesome is you pull out random books that you would never look at, except you're in a bookstore that's three stories tall. And it's, I pulled out this book, which was uh, every commercial aviation, every fatal commercial aviation accident in history, and what was learned from it. It was a little gruesome. I will give you that. But it was also fascinating, because it would say, all right, well, you know, here was this thing, and there was some emergency, and the pilots flipped this switch, you know, which said crash into the ground, instead of flipping the other switch, switch which said, uh, you know, save everyone's life. Maybe we should have those switches further apart. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that, that, that's that same kind of... And, same kind of thing. There are, there are things that are connected together in ways that you just, you can't anticipate. And when you're operating large systems, you're going to discover coupling all the time, and you're going to be back in this space where you have to say, uh, am I going to decouple this? Uh, or am I going to not decouple this and have to explain this disaster again in a year? You know, and that's a reasonable trade-off to think about. Um, so, th this is the original definition of coupling. If I change this, two elements with respect to a change, if I change this, I also have to change that. And one of the other interesting nuances of coupling that I didn't suspect at first was your tools have a part to play in whether elements are coupled. 
So if I have uh, re automated refactorings and I want to change the name of a function that's called a thousand places, but that's one change. I bring up the change the name of this function dialog in Eclipse. It was a beautiful, wow, don't get me started on refactoring. You're not getting me started on refactoring. I'm getting me started on refactoring. I understand that, but I figured I'd pick on you just for a second. <laughs> because I can make that change in a single atomic activity, then those functions aren't coupled with respect to the name of the called function. Because it doesn't matter, do I call it ten, one time, 10 times, 100, 1,000, a million, I change the name once, it gets changed everywhere. I'm guaranteed that there won't be, it, I won't accidentally break any of the semantics and we're finished. So it's not just the software design that dictates the coupling, but the tooling that you use also changes what is coupled and what is not. Another reason you can't just take the software run it through the coupling detection machine and come out with uh, 4.7 and have that mean anything. Oh, and, and so, what do I want to talk about next? So uh, another thread, one, one of the things about ideas is it's always the combination of stuff that comes in. And one of the ideas that I've been fascinated with wow, I don't even remember, probably 95, was, uh, were, were these power law distributions, where if you, uh, uh, if you look at the number of callers of a function, if we make a histogram and we say, how many people call a function and how many functions are called exactly once, we get a whole bunch, and then it, if, how many functions are called Twice, we get kind of half that many are called twice. And how many are called four times, and it's like half that many, and, and, and. If we plot that on a linear, uh, a linear histogram, it goes way, way up for the small number of callers. And then the, the most called function is going to be called a ridiculous number of times. And I thought, well, that can't be right. You know, the same is true of, uh, say, cyclomatic complexity. You're going to have a whole bunch of functions of cyclomatic complexity one, and you're going to have one function that's cyclomatic complexity like 600. And you look at that and you think, well, you know, what idiot wrote that? And it turns out you did. <laughs> and it's not your fault, kind of not your fault, because if you... How far, how deep do I want to go into this? I get so excited about this. If you, if you change the axes of this log, and I've got some stuff published about this, and feel free to ask me about it more. I promise this is only going to last one more minute. If you change the axes of that, that um, graph to logarithmic, 1, 10, 100,000, million, or 10, 000, 100,000, million, and the same, you get an absolutely straight line. How does that happen? Well, coupling is exactly one of these phenomenon, and it's, it happens the same way that avalanches happen because you have one snowflake that falls over and it has some chance of knocking two snowflakes over, and those snowflakes knock more snowflakes over. I mean, if you could get to that first one and tell it to just hold still for a second, you'd be okay, but, but that's not how nature works. Hurricanes. Same kind of thing. The bigger the hurricane gets, the more energy it gathers. Coupling is the same kind of way. You're going to have some areas with lots of coupling and some areas with, with very little coupling. And as designers, that's what we're doing. We're navigating this bumpy space. We're trying to find the ones that have more coupling than we, than we would like, and we're trying to reduce that coupling. Okay, so I said coupling is potentially everywhere. If we took every element of the system, imagine the system you work on, every single function, every single class, every single process, 
every single service, and we listed them, and started making X's of, if I change this, I'm also going to have to change that. You can't hold all that in your head. So the second observation that Larry and Ed made was that the inverse of coupling is also valuable. <clears throat> Not the inverse of coupling. The span of coupling is important to look at. And they coined the name cohesion to talk about that. And again, cohesion is one of those words that has just kind of, is, is this stuff go together? Yes. Ooh, then it's cohesive. Do we, do, does this class do one thing? Well, yeah, I think it, this, what's a oh, single responsibility principle, you know, which is like a stick that you use to hit other people with. <laughs> Am I? It's, it's kind of, it's got a big knob on the end and whack. And, and, it's, and it's an argument, right? Does this, does this class do one thing? Well, yes. What? Well, this and that. <laughs> Is it cohesive? Yes, I would say it's cohesive. <laughs> There's a technical definition in structure design of what cohesion means. And now I can, I think, explain why it matters. That, that was the part that took me 2005 till about 2020, maybe. So only 15 years. Better than average for me. <laughs> I'm just really stubborn. That's, that's, that's it. So what is, what is cohesion? Technically cohesion, an element E is cohesive if its sub-elements are coupled. E1 dot 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 EN. That's all it means. Now you look at that and you think, isn't that bad? Don't you not want to have the coupling of your sub-elements? Wouldn't that be better? Like more cohesion is better, right? Yes. Well, but more coupling is bad, right? Yes. But if cohesion is coupling, <laughs> it's, I don't feel bad it took me 15 years. <laughs> and the answer to that is, it's, a compared, it's one of these compared to what? One of the most powerful questions you can ask in history is compared to what? You know, when I coach people, somebody will come to me and they'll say, oh, I'm just the worst programmer ever. And I say, well, compared to what? <laughs> and then we're making some progress. Now, sometimes they're right. <laughs> but that's a separate issue. Then, then we kind of shift gears in the conversation. Okay, so here I've, here I've got an element, and I want to know if it's cohesive. So it has some sub-elements. Say this is a file. Why are we still putting source code in files? Could somebody explain? Never mind. <laughs> uh, it bugs me, but anyway. Okay, so th these sub-elements are all coupled. If I change one of them, I have a file with three functions, and if I change one of them, I have to change the other ones too. Okay. Uh, well, isn't that bad? Well, compared to what? What if we take this and we put it in a different file? And now we have coupling that crosses these file boundaries. That's definitely worse. Because now if we want to know, I want to make this change, can I make, can I just, what do I need to change? Now I have to go examine two files. The files aren't in the same directory. Can anybody explain why we put source code in direct? Never mind. We have to go examine more directories to find everything. So the more spread out the coupling is, the more expensive it gets. The less like we are, likely we are to see it. Oh, here's a great way to find coupling uh, in your code that requires a very sophisticated technical answer um, called search. You say, <clears throat> 
uh, be sure. You search for the, the phrase, be sure. Because you'll see comments like, if you change this function, be sure to also. <laughs> That's coupling at a distance. And you can reduce the cost of changing that code by reducing the distance. So in this, this case here, if I move this function into the same directory as the other functions it's coupled to, I've reduced the cost of making changes to it. I haven't gotten rid of any coupling, but the coupling that's there is cheaper. And that's what cohesion is. An element is cohesive if the sub-elements are coupled to each other. Now, if you follow that and you increase the cohesion of your elements, you're going to find yourself breaking your system into smaller and smaller chunks. Because otherwise, if you have big chunks of stuff, there'll be parts that aren't coupled to each other, and you can find someplace else to put that. Which brings me to one of the, the challenging aspects of writing about software design is there are two audiences for writing about software design. There are lumpers and splitters. And lumpers want to see everything all in one place. And splitters want to pull stuff apart into little pieces so they can understand the pieces separately. And uh, you'll know a code base that has all lumpers because you'll have great big functions in great big uh, files in great big directories and not very many of them. And if you see one that's all splitters, you'll have little bits and pieces and no computation ever seems to take place anywhere. <laughs> and yet the system runs. So... What's up about that? And then you, you can also tell the difference when you have some lumpers and some splitters because there's, there's blood and broken glass everywhere. And... <laughs> All right, so maybe it's not quite that bad where you are. but uh... um, Okay, so that's coupling and cohesion. Those are the technical definitions. I'm not going to say these are the definitions. These are the original definitions of coupling and cohesion. And I don't care if we call them A and B or B blat and blort or whatever, but though these specific properties of a design help drive decisions that are going to reduce the cost of, the, of software development over time. So I want to keep those original definitions in mind. All the other these things are related to those things or depend on or whatever, those are fine, but I would like to use different words for those. So I'm gonna just say coupling and cohesion because it's my book. And then we'll see what happens after that. Okay. Um, next is, ah, so, so I'm writing this book and I'm trying to understand uh, the role, the place, the moment of software design in a development process. And where I came to was, here's the basic loop of, of software development. You get an idea for what the software should do, and then you change its behavior to do that. And then as soon as you change the behavior of the software to do that, then you get more ideas. Oh, we could also do this or that or this thing, which is why, okay, short rant. The, the waterfall, I don't know if you knew this, is back. <laughs> Italian has great words for this, what I'm feeling right now. Here's the thing. There was about 10, 15 years where people would still do waterfall -y stuff and they'd apologize for it. And I thought that was progress. Well, we, we, we spent six months carefully surveying the domain. Yeah, we know. 
We know. We know. Now? No. <laughs> of course. You begin with a careful and thorough just nerf, 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 nerf. It's analysis. It's based on speculation. And the moment the software goes into production, all of those decisions are going to change. So why not put the software into production now? It's the same reality we all had to deal with. But now people are no longer apologizing for operating in a patently ineffective way. <sighs> Thank you for being here for, for this. Okay, so here's the basic loop. You have some ideas. You need to change the behavior. That gives you more ideas. And you get into this loop. And every change that you make to the behavior of the system, back to economics is either going to increase revenue or it's going to reduce costs. If it's not, then why are you changing the behavior? Even if it's an expected value calculation, you're like, well, I think people will use this, and so we'll make more money. That's fine. But there's immediate economic value out of changes to the behavior of the system. But as designers, we know this is not the whole picture as I was walking over here, walking over a canal, I was looking at ducks, and the ducks are serenely floating along. And then I noticed down under the duck, I could see under the water, and the feet are just paddling furiously. That is software design. <laughs> and then I noticed some other stuff happening under the water, which is also software design. But <laughs> sorry. Anyway. So the structure of the system radically affects the cost of changes to the behavior of the system. So sometimes we'll get an idea and we'll think, hmm, before I just go and implement that and I change this code that's scattered all over 50 different files, maybe I'll cohere, that's the verb form of increasing the cohesion, I'll cohere the, the software first and then I can make the relatively easy change. And this is the, this, I came up with this phrase with a student, uh, for every hard change, make the change easy. Notice, this may be hard. Then make the easy change. And this is addressing exactly this masochistic, self-flagellant. No, you know, if I have to make some change and it's really hard, it's one of my options is to go and make it easy to make that change. But making that change easy can be hard, so you have to apply, apply this recursively in kind of a zipper. So you, you know, and blah, blah, but the, to do that, I'd have to change, and then to do that, and then I'd need to build a tool for that, and then zip. That's, that's the story, and I'm sticking to it. So this flow from idea to structure change to behavior change is exactly this tidy first flow. That's the moment where you say, well, I could... I could change the behavior by going and editing 50 files, or I could change the structure so that I only have to change one file. And to finish the, the picture, uh, sometimes you just get sick of it, and you just, like, I've edited this file 85 times, and I always get it wrong, and so I'm just going to go change the structure. This is a little more speculative, um, and can be dangerous. And here's part of the magic of software is that sometimes the structure of the system uh, suggests ideas. You're having uh, Friday beers with a colleague, and they say, oh, I wish we could just build blah, 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 and you're like, that sounds easy. I know, as somebody who lives inside the code that that would be easy to do. So let's just try it. And you can have an experiment that's cheap because you happen to understand the structure. So part of the problem with this picture is that behavior changes are very visible. The, they're, the, they're things that go on the roadmap. They're things that have uh, obvious economic impact. And the things, the changes that you make to structure are uh, uh, 
one step removed from that. They change the optionality of the system. They make certain things easier. Changing the structure makes certain things cheaper or easier or safer to change in the behavior world. But optionality is harder to account for than, than actual revenue. And so I think everybody who's involved in software gets the feeling that we underinvest in structure and we overinvest in behavior, which taken over a span of time means we get fewer behavior changes than we could have gotten if we'd balanced the investment both ways. So a uh, uh, concrete takeaway from Tidy First is to separate your changes of the behavior from your changes to the structure. Changes to behavior tend to be irreversible. If we change the numbers that we report to the tax authority and we get it wrong, that's an expensive mistake. If I extract a helper function and you don't like it and you inline it, it's easily reversible. Uh, if So reviewing behavior changes requires more understanding and more care. I want to see new test cases for behavior changes, and I want to understand that they cover the situations that will occur in production. Behavior changes, I can pretty much just stamp. And so a simple thing that you could do even just for yourself is start labeling them S and B or B and S, but that's a different. Just start labeling your changes S and B. And if you get into that moment where you're changing the behavior, changing the behavior, and you're like, oh, and this variable is named the wrong thing, okay. Uh, either do it afterwards or throw away the changes you made, change the name of the variable, and then make the changes. Either one is fine, as long as the two are separated. Because the treatment of those changes can be very, very different. So, um, I'm going to give you the three-minute version of this, which was going to take 20 minutes. Here's a thing I noticed last week. I was working with some very good programmers who were uh, maybe five years in, four or five years in. And what I noticed was they were all solving problems that were too hard. How's that work? Well, when you're a beginner program, pr programmer, you, you don't know how to deal with complexity. And then you learn some little trick so you learn some skill, and now you can deal with a little more complexity. So you grab the next bigger problem in complexity. And then you try to do that, and you kind of fumble, but you learn the skill. And then you can grab some more complexity. And that cycle works for four or five years just fine. People get more and more skills to handle more and more complexity at once. Eventually, though, your brain, you hit the limits of your brain. And now the learning strategy switches. And what I noticed about the people I was working with last week were they, they were either almost ready to make that switch or th they were not ready to make that switch. And the switch is when experts approach a problem, they, they don't bring their wizard-like powers to it. The first thing they do is try and separated up into smaller problems, which can be addressed with ordinary levels of skill. Now, that decomposition can take a lot of creativity and a lot of skill. The, the, uh, th this is a good example, this separation between behavior and structure. A, a pretty good programmer will know to clean stuff up as they're implementing things, and they'll mush it all together. But eventually, you got too many changes going at once, and you get confused. And then that skill of saying, well, I'm going to change the structure a little bit. Then I'll change the behavior a little bit. Then I'll change the structure, and I'm going to keep those very separate. That becomes the skill that's required to take the, the next level up of, of complexity. 
So this separation between behavior and structure changes is a, an example of this complexity partitioning. DDD has a powerful set of tools for complexity partitioning. This coming up with bounded context is exactly a partition. Inside of this, I have to have a certain level of knowledge from the outside of it. I can ignore most of the knowledge that's inside of that. And then every once in a while, the boundaries are going to be all wrong, and then you have to switch it up. But that's a learning opportunity. So there we go. So uh, what I'd... What I did for the people I was working with and what I'd recommend to you is become aware of those moments when you're trying to solve a hard problem and see if you can break it into solving easier problems that compose. The test-driven development is another one of these complexity partitioning strategies where I don't know how to implement it, but of course I can write a test for it, so write the test for it. Oh, well, then implementing it's easy. I just have to make the test pass. Okay. But if you put the two together, you're doing something that would have been really hard to do if you tried to do them together. Uh, another example is this make it run, make it write, where programmers want clean code that works, and they think that means they have to write clean code that works. No, it doesn't. You can write that works, and then do the clean code part separately. And then you have two brain-sized problems instead of having one overwhelming problem. So to conclude, tidy first is about this relationship with yourself in this picture. Th thank you to whoever's timer that was. <laughs> it was so nice. It's such a helpful crowd. Tidy first is becoming aware of when you have an opportunity to change a structure that helps you change the behavior. And taking into account all of the variables, all of these technical influences for answering that question. That's a way of healing your relationship with yourself. When you've done that, you are better prepared to build and maintain relationships with other geeks, the other people on your team, where your software design decisions are affecting me. You change some API that I call. If you say, you know, take it or leave it, we're going to have issues. <laughs> but if you realize that this is a relationship problem and you just caused me work and it's your responsibility to bring our relationship back into balance, then we'll be able to continue developing together. That's the next level up, and the, th that's the next book. And then the last, the last uh, level of it is maintaining those relationships with the, the business sponsors, the users, the managers, product design, all the other people with very different perspectives on software development, and I believe that software design also has a, a role to play in that. But first, ask yourself, is this a case where I can help myself by tidying first? Thank you all so much for your time and attention. <laughs> <laughs>